Hello and welcome to what is a decidedly grey day, I have to say, here in Bristol. I don't know how it is with you, but luckily I have a very colourful topic, which is orchestration. The RLPO programme had two fantastic orchestral works that I was looking forward to exploring. Dukas' Sorcerer's Apprentice and Ratmaninoff's Symphonic Dances. Now both Dukas and Ratmaninoff share the fact that they were brilliant orchestrators and they are part really of a wonderful Russian and French lineage in that respect. If you think of the Russian and French composers, they're known, aren't they, for being flamboyant and particularly charismatic with their use of the orchestra. I'm going to say even exuberant at times. They are colorists and poets and Dukas and Ratmaninoff are very much in that lineage and legacy. Let's think about it. In the French side you've got Berlioz who wrote a treatise on the matter, who was often actually quite rude about the orchestra, particularly the viola section. Sorry about that. And then after him came Dukas and Chabrier, and after them, well, Debussy and Ravel, amazing poets of sound. And after them, Massien, Dutier, fantastic orchestrators. Think of the Russians, well, Glinka, the father of Russian classical music with his Technicolor operas. And after him, Rimsky, Korsakov and Tchaikovsky and Ratmaninoff really following in that vein, uh, as well as Scriabin. And on the other side of the fence, still brilliant orchestrators, you have Stravinsky and Prokofiev and others. So yes, both countries sharing wonderful traditions when it comes to orchestration. What is orchestration? Quite simply, it's writing for the orchestra. I mean, you know that. But let's be more poetic. Let's say that orchestration is actually sculpting sound. It's creating something three-dimensional. You're thinking about the weight of the sonority, the density of the texture, the depth of field. And Rimsky-Korsakov said that to orchestrate was to create. By that he meant it's not just a matter of taking a piano tune and transcribing it for orchestra mechanically, but you're having to really at root reimagine the sound, re-envision it with a completely new oral landscape. And I often think that composers for the orchestra must be like kids in a sweet shop, just overwhelmed with all these various different sounds. There's multiplicity of opportunities in front of them that they can choose from. It's really a wonderful craft and it takes so long to learn. Let's just um, give you a sense of what it's about. I'm going to take a piece by Ravel, uh, his Pavan for a Dead Princess. And this is the piano version, paid by uh, Bertrand Chameau. And this is the middle part. Now, you'll hear a dialogue between something very delicate and high and then something sweeping up beneath. And the question for you is, OK, so how would you set this for orchestra? Just twinkling, and then oh, So romantic, isn't it? And then again, in a darker key. We need a darker instrument, therefore. And that idea now fuller, with a counter melody falling chromatically. Beautiful cadence there. So what would you have done for that, that upper line, first of all, that silver? Maybe the woodwind somewhere? Are you in that kind of ambit? I certainly am. Let's see what Ravel does. Can you remember if you know this piece? Well, he starts let me just tell you, with the flute and uh, that tremulous, almost kind of vulnerable quality um, and, yet, and yet warm. Here we go. Just pulsing strings. And if you heard a harp there, you were right. 
strings answering in that romantic surge beneath. Half again. Now a pair of darker coloured clarinets. Strings. This time with the cellos leading the sound. Who's going to take that counter melody? That's the horn right up there. Wow. And the low woodwinds there, bringing us to rest. It's brilliantly imaginative, isn't it? Just in those 20 seconds, you've got a sense of Ravel's skill as an orchestrator, I think. So it's not just about picking instruments. That, I suppose, we'd call instrumentation, being aware of the limitations and the capabilities of any one given instrument. Orchestration is about the whole picture, isn't it? And how you bring it all together. And there are four con considerations, four guiding principles here that we should bear in mind. The first is function. What function are you gonna give to each instrument within the texture? So in a classical or romantic piece, you'd think of having a clear bass and then an accompanying figure, a melody, of course, leading the ear, perhaps, and then, depending on the composer, several counter melodies beneath that. So let's just listen to some Beethoven to hear how he ascribes different roles and functions to different members of the orchestra. This is the slow movement from his seventh symphony, which starts in a very tragic mode. And I'm going to join it at the place where the sun comes in and we have the clarinet leading that idea as the melody instrument. Let's just find it for you. Um, a beautiful moment where the clouds clear. Yes, just about here. Okay. Okay, so beneath, tiga da tiga, upper strings, accompany, and at the bottom, dum dum dum, di pizzicato, dum dum dum, in the cellos and basses. Flutes there, lending a new colour to the line, and our dialogue. The keen sound of the clarinet, answered by the mellower sound of the horn. Back to the texture we had before, this time with more weight. All the roles perfectly ascribed, aren't they, within the orchestra? It was desperately pleasing to hear something with such equipoise. That's Beethoven, who was revered by Berlioz as the master orchestrator but we should I think give a shout out to who came before Beethoven and set wonderful precedents let's think of Vivaldi certainly with his exploration of string sound in particular and Corelli uh, the Italian concerto writers Bach of course Bach the Brandenburg concerto spring to mind the sixth Brandenburg concerto you know it's written for Viola da Gamba you know the uh, equivalent of violas now and what he does with that viola and uh, cello and bass section is amazing the colors he brings out of that particular sort of constrained uh, collection of sounds and then after Bach yes we get on to the Mannheim school of composers Stamitz and others really experimenting with what the new orchestral sound could do at the beginning of the classical era Haydn is chucking out a, a Turkish march with banging bass drums and glittering percussion in his military symphony. And Beethoven definitely taking a leaf out of Heine's book. And uh, after Beethoven, I suppose, yes, Berlioz, and we've talked about the other composers in the lineage since then. So there are, as I said, four elements that we can hold in mind. The first of those were or oh, was function, the function of each instrument. What comes after that? Well, I suppose the balance. How do we balance those elements within the orchestra? So, for example, with that clarinet tune, had you put it on 
the flute, maybe it would have been not so clear uh, in that particular register. Maybe it wouldn't quite have carried in the same way. Or the horn, for example, not quite uh, the, the colour we would want. So you're thinking about the dynamics and you're thinking about where in the instruments the material lies and where are the weak points of those instruments and, and these kind of things. And an ancillary question really is colour. The third point here, colour. Uh, this can be thought of in terms of individual colours and then the colour of the whole texture. And here, if you want an exploration of colour, look no further than The Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. Really, that's all you need in order to learn about what instruments are capable of. And often Stravinsky is finding new colours by going against the grain of the instrument. Think of that iconic opening to The Rite of Spring. The bassoon up high, straining, improvising a tune. And then these murkier instruments coming beneath. Bass clarinets, wonderfully dark but suggestive sound. And bassoons, wonderful, wonderful. So, yes, Stravinsky, a complete master at finding new colours from his instruments. And the other aspect, I suppose, is texture and the colour of the whole uh, orchestral sound. And again, let's stick with Rite of Spring. Here, you're going to hear six violas singing way up high again in the, in the treble register, not in their alto clef where they are most comfortable, but up high, so it's particularly strident, and six of them as soloists in a choir. And beneath them, two uh, cello soloists, and then the rest of the cello section. And again, the double basses have been assigned different roles as well. So it's a remarkable colour, but really because of those six violas, it's a very dense sound. mournful isn't it wailing really up there <laughs> love that stasis of sounds don't you just a hovering woodwind section there with boom 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 pizzicato in the strings once you've heard that sound, you never forget it, do you? It's, it's a remarkable sound, a remarkable colour and combination. And I suppose uh, the fourth element here um, is texture and how dense or sparse it is and how you consider the vertical aspect of the orchestra, how you're going to just sort of line out all the weights of sound across that. And I suppose with texture, you're dealing with the most magical of elements here. It's, it's rather elusive. How do you create something that you can almost touch and feel? Let's listen now to how Duka and Ratmaninoff treat texture as well as the other three concerns. So I'm going to turn to uh, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, written in 1894, and spare a thought for Duka. I mean, he was a Prix de Rome winner the most prestigious composing prize there was at the time in Europe. And, and yet he's forever associated now, isn't he, with Mickey Mouse. Can't escape that. Fantasia, of course, being the piece that uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice provides the underscore to. So let's dive in to a particularly mischievous part of this score. And what strikes me here is how busy the interchange is between the woodwind and the upper strings, and it's so bright. And we have a muted trumpet that adds extra mischief. It's something 
almost pugnacious about a muted trumpet when it's popped out at that, that register. And the use of a glockenspiel to make everything have a, a particular sort of magical quality. So let's just go to that part. Everything chattering away rather wonderfully. It's a great score, this. Mayhem already. Did you hear that? That fast interchange. Glockenspiel. Imagine it without Glockenspiel. It wouldn't be quite the same. And then they blast in with the, the brass section. You have that well-timed cymbal. Like that snarl, almost. Brilliant writing. And he's equally as imaginative in the bass register as well. I don't know if you know the original Goethe story, but you probably know the cartoon, if nothing else. And you'll know that uh, at one point, the Sorcerer's Apprentice breaks the broom in order to stop the magic somehow. But unfortunately, the spell is still intact. And the broom, rather menacingly, begins in its various pieces to get up and they form lots of different brooms and so there's even more uh, chaos to ensue. So let's go to that because it's, it's such um, a wonderful treatment of the lower register of the section. Oh, there's a contrabassoon and bass drums. Oh, no. Serpent. Just horns going pop. Like that. So we've had bass clarinet, and now this is clarinet. And the theme coming back on the jaunty bassoon. Once you've heard it on the bassoon, you can't imagine it on any other instrument, can you? What's wonderful if you want to dip back into this at some point later is how we go from that bass register right right back up into the full orchestra with the whole tessiture of sound it's 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 beautiful orchestration almost a master class okay let's consider Rachmaninoff wonderfully nostalgic these uh, symphonic dances written right at the end of his life and full of course of the energy and drive of dance but also looking back fondly on his earlier compositions and one of those compositions or genres at least that he was most associated with was of course the piano concerto so i'm going to go into the first of the symphonic dances now and this is the moment where he remembers certain sounds of the piano concerto and you even have a an, an orchestral piano there just giving that echo very definitely um, let me just find this for you it's you can imagine him having great fun writing this just remembering his favorite moments from his earlier works before going out on a high if you think that this is the last orchestral work that he wrote, if you're going to go out, you might as well go out with a bang, right? And he certainly does with these symphonic dances. So the iconic sound for Rachmaninoff and many of the Russians has to be this string sound, right, coming up. Just tugging on the heartstrings, isn't it? Moving perfectly together, gliding across the ballroom floor. The Berlin fill strings there under rattle. Oh, I don't want to press pause, but I've got to. Do you hear the woodwind choir coming in? And yes, we call them choirs, the string choir, the woodwind choir. Just adding um, 
holy glow almost to that that memory. It's so beautiful. So yes, that is a signature sound, isn't it, for Ratmanov? But also, is his uh, particularly dark treatment of woodwind solo sounds. That's equally as a sort of characteristic of his writing. So if we go to that same section, but this time cast for the woodwind, you'll hear a rather novel sound, which um, he uses very beautifully. But this kind of darkness that still manages to be burnished and be alive is so beautiful. Echoes of the second symphony there as well. Can you hear that? An alto saxophone. Oh my goodness, we couldn't get more nostalgic than an alto saxophone in that range. Cor anglais. Beautiful chamber writing, isn't it? It's not all about having a big, hefty orchestral sound. The alto saxophone, which can be so perky and bright, here muted, mellower, perhaps, with the passage of time, representing someone looking back. Am I reading too much into it? I don't know. That's part of the fun, though, isn't it? Either way, you've got some wonderful colours there being used by Ratmanov. And for my final excerpt for you, I'm going to go to the end of that dance where everything seems to just gently evaporate. And there's a quote from his first symphony, a symphony that was much pilloried in its time and had a, a horrible effect on his psyche, that, that, that criticism cut him deep, but he remembers it now fondly. And you'll hear it uh, sung in the strings and around it, almost like dust, just motes of dust, you have pizzicato on the harp and, and glockenspiel. Well, just, just listen to it. It's a magical, magical effect. And as we go up, as we evaporate, listen out for the tremolando bows as well, something that he uses particularly effectively. I love how this comes right in the last breath of this dance, almost like an afterthought. Tremolando, everything dissolving. Glockenspiel. Just referencing that symphony, Adam Brayton the tune. And then the energy comes back in. Now you might say, well, that was rather soupy excerpt to finish on but look it's meant to be nostalgic isn't it it's meant to have that quality of a flashback in a film with soft focus around the edges and i think the glockenspiel just gives us that sort of bird edge it's beautiful isn't it magical so we thought about the function the balance the color and the texture of the orchestra and the art of the orchestrator i hope that's given you some new ways of listening to the orchestral repertoire. And I can't wait to experience it with you live, actually, in a concert hall. We might have to wait a little while until then. But until that point, happy listening.